When I was at university, I did a gender studies unit. The teachers of this unit de-emphasized biological explanations of gender. A man was not a man by virtue of his biology, but by virtue of his culture. Men were more aggressive than women, not because of a biological predisposition towards aggression, but because of the toys they played with as children. This struck me as stupid and simplistic. And yet, I remained interested in the topic. What makes a man a man? What makes a woman a woman? These are interesting questions that our culture increasingly struggles to answer. Someone who has thought extensively about these questions is the writer and cultural critic, Camille Paglia. This video will draw on Paglia's work to answer questions such as, what is man? What is woman? But before we get into this, I want to speak a little bit more about Camille Paglia. Paglia was born in Endicott, New York in 1947. All four of her grandparents were born in Italy, and she was raised as a Roman Catholic. As a teenager, she moved away from Catholicism and became an atheist. Nevertheless, she still cites Italian Catholicism as the strongest influence on her personal identity. To quote an interview she conducted with the Jesuit Review in 2015, Italian Catholicism remains my deepest identity in the same way that many secular Jews feel a strong cultural bond with Judaism. Over time I realised, and this became a main premise of my first book, Sexual Personae, that what had always fascinated me in Italian Catholicism was its pagan residue. I loved the cult of saints, the bejeweled ceremonialism, the eerie litanies of Mary, all the things, in other words, that Martin Luther and the other Protestant reformers rightly condemned as medieval Romanist intrusions into primitive Christianity. Paglia's Italian upbringing inspired her to dress up as a Roman soldier when she was seven. This was just one of the many unusual Halloween costumes that Paglia wore as a child. When she was five, she dressed up as Robin Hood. When she was eight, she dressed up as Napoleon. And when she was nine, she dressed up as Hamlet. Puglia's identification with heroic masculine figures would have been considered unusual in 1950s America. Back then, gender roles were much more rigidly defined. As a non-gendered entity, Puglia found this absolutely suffocating. She saw her adoption of male personas as an act of rebellion against rigid gender roles. I found the 1950s utterly suffocating. I was, mm -hmm. I was a you know, gender non-conforming <laughs> entity, right? and I was signaling my, my rebellion by these transgender Halloween costumes. They were absolutely unheard of. I was like five, six, seven, and eight. My parents allowed me to do it because I was, I was so What were you dressing up as? A Roman soldier, the matador <laughs> from Carmen. Uh, my, my best was Napoleon. <laughs> I was Hamlet from the classics comics book and so on. I mean, absolutely no one was yeah. doing anything like this. Right? Puglia believes that the masks we wear reveal our true nature. Etymologically, person comes from the Latin word persona, which means mask. To be a person is to wear a mask and act out a role. Her first book and magnum opus, Sexual Personae, shows how much of Western life, art, and thought is ruled by personality, which the book traces through recurrent types of personae, masks. The fact that Paglia adopted male masks as a child reveals much about her. Indeed, Paglia now identifies as transgender. Paglia's androgyny and transgender identity gives her a unique perspective on gender issues. She is able to view things from both a male and female lens. Okay, I'm, I'm saying in effect, okay, that I feel that I straddle borderlines in the sexes, traditionally, going back thousands of years, okay, you have a tradition of, of, of shamans who are uh, kind of sexually dual or sexually fluid in some way. That's like a tradition. It goes back, and many, many cultures have that. That, you know, the shaman is like a man who is a, who is a woman, and, and, they, and they, 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 they served a certain function in communities. Uh, they were instrumental in the vision quest. Uh, they would, like, have these dreams that would, where the reality would be revealed to them, and they would come back to the tribe and tell them. So they were, they, you know, they functioned really, you know, as, as, as artists. Paglia's androgyny led her to question the reality of gender norms. Like many, she believed that gender norms were totally artificial. She would eventually abandon this belief in light of her anthropological and historical research. 
This research would eventually lead to the construction of her first book, Sexual Personae. Sexual Personae begins by arguing that most cultures throughout history have associated women with nature. According to Paglia, the identification of women with nature was universal in prehistory. In hunter-gatherer societies dependent upon nature, femaleness was honoured as a principle of fertility. The first exhibit from Western art that she examines in sexual personae is the Venus of Willendorf, a tiny statuette found in Austria, believed to be more than 30,000 years old. Paglia argues that the Venus of Willendorf is faceless because identity does not yet exist. Everyone in prehistory was a part of the oneness of nature. Her fat is a symbol of abundance in an age of famine. Her exaggerated hips and breasts, a symbol of fertility. Paglia discussed this statuette at a lecture given at Lafayette College. Um, uh, we, we feel, you know, from this object, the, the, the force of nature, the force of biology. W woman does not exist here as an individual, but as someone who essentially is a, is a conduit okay, for, for, for natural forces. I notice how uh, she exists simply as a series of protuberances. So the, the, the fat in this era meant health. It meant survival. Okay? Uh, it, it, the cult of the thin woman is really one of a sophisticated, more urban or, or aristocratic period. Um, you'll notice that, uh, that she's defined by, by her fat deposits, by the buttocks, by the uh, belly, hips, and breasts. Uh, her arms are nothing but, but, but small flippers on, on the top of her, of her uh, breasts. And then um, uh, the, um, the, the feet, uh, repeatedly, in these Stone Age objects, um, have been broken off, okay, a ritual breaking off. Uh, and this is not the, the result of, of accidental damage. Uh, and I, I, my theory about it is that uh, this is, she's supposed to represent the principle of fertility. They want fertility to stay uh, because of you know, the tremendous um, difficulties of, of, of remaining pregnant in, in a period where uh, of uh, constant famine and, uh, you know, and um, near, near starvation and so on. They want her to remain, so they break her feet off. So again, this, the centrality of, of woman and of, of woman's fertility and of, um, it was, it, this dates to, you know, from a period in which human beings did not understand how pregnancy occurred, okay, because there is a delay uh, between um, sexual intercourse, okay, and a woman, a woman's pregnancy showing, uh, you know, primitive man did not believe uh, that, that he was in any way responsible for a birth, and somehow it was a woman in magical uh, communication with nature who had this, in, 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 this, this internal power. The link between women and nature was not just recognised in prehistoric hunter-gatherer societies. Indeed, cultures throughout history have personified nature as a mother. In Norse mythology, the goddess Jord personified the earth. In ancient Greece, it was Gaia. In ancient Babylon, Ishtar. There are records of similar goddesses in Sumer, Egypt, Africa, Australia and China. Till this day, we speak of Mother Nature. The word itself comes from the Latin natura, meaning birth. The link between women and nature appears, therefore, to be a cross-cultural phenomenon. People everywhere have symbolised primeval nature as a woman. These goddess figurines were most popular in the period before agriculture, when people were more vulnerable to nature. To quote Paglia, the identification of women with nature was universal in prehistory. In hunting or agrarian societies dependent upon nature, femaleness was honoured as an imminent principle of fertility. As culture progressed, crafts and commerce supplied a concentration of resources, freeing men from the caprices of weather or the handicap of geography. With nature at one remove, femaleness receded in importance. In other words, the more dependent people are on nature, the more likely they are to worship the Earth Mother. When men begin to assert control over Mother Nature, they stop worshipping her. This phenomenon is reflected in both archaeology and mythology. In early and prehistory, female figurines far outnumber male ones. This suggests that women were at the centre of early religion, but as society develops, these idols become less and less common. Instead of worshipping the Earth Mother, people begin to worship the Sky Father. To quote Paglia, Western culture, from the start, has swerved from femaleness. 
both the Apollonian and Judeo-Christian traditions are transcendental. That is, they seek to surmount or transcend nature. Judaism, Christianity's parent sect, is the most powerful of protests against nature. The Old Testament asserts that a father god made nature and that differentiation into objects and gender was after the fact of his maleness. Judeo-Christianity, like Greek worship of the Olympian gods, is a sky cult. It is an advanced stage in the history of religion, which everywhere began as earth cult, veneration of fruitful nature. The earth cult and the sky cult are fundamentally different. The earth cult venerates nature, whilst the sky cult venerates culture. The earth cult venerates instinct, whilst the sky cult venerates reason. The earth cult venerates sex, the sky cult seeks to suppress and regulate it. The earth cult venerates the feminine, whilst the sky cult venerates the masculine. Thus, when a society transitions from earth cult to sky cult, woman's significance recedes. To quote Paglia once again, The evolution from earth cult to sky cult shifts woman into the never realm. Her mysterious procreative powers and the resemblance of her rounded breasts, belly, and hips to earth's contours put her at the center of early symbolism. She was the model for the great mother figures who crowded the birth of religion worldwide. Woman was an idol of belly magic. She seemed to swell and give birth by her own law. From the beginning of time, woman has seemed an uncanny being. Man honored but feared her. She was the black moor that had spat him forth and would devour him anew. Men, bonding together, invented culture as a defense against female nature. Sky cult was the most sophisticated step in this process, for its switch of the creative locus from earth to sky is a shift from belly magic to head magic, and from the defense of head magic has come the spectacular glory of male civilization, which has lifted women with it. In ancient Greece, the premier god of the sky cult was Apollo. He was associated with masculinity, light, clarity, celibacy, reason, and solidity. Apollo revolted against chthonic nature, which Puglia associates with the Greek god Dionysus. Dionysus was the god of wine and intoxication. Artistic depictions of Dionysus vary. Sometimes he appears as a mature figure with a beard, as in this bronze mask from 200 BC. Other times, he is an androgynous young man with beautiful curls and fair skin, as depicted in the second century Roman statue. He is almost always depicted with the grape cluster and ivy vine. Dionysus was strongly associated with feminine spirituality and power. His cult was predominantly female. They would worship him by tearing wild animals to pieces and eating the whole of them raw. They would also spend whole nights dancing on hills in a state of ecstasy and intoxication, probably induced by wine. These festivals were associated with chanting, snake handling, and the wearing of fawn skins. The women involved were often accused of sexual immorality. Paglia argues that the primary conflict in Western culture is between Apollo and Dionysus. She summarizes this conflict as follows. My theory is this. Dionysus is identification, Apollo objectification. Dionysus is the empathic, the sympathetic emotion transporting us into other people, other places, other times. Apollo is the hard, cold separatism of Western personality and categorical thought. Dionysus is energy, ecstasy, hysteria, promiscuity, emotionalism, heedless indiscriminateness of idea or practice. Apollo is obsessiveness, voyeurism, idolatry, fascism, frigidity and aggression of the eye, petrification of objects. The quarrel between Apollo and Dionysus is the quarrel between the higher cortex and the older limbic and reptilian brains. In the West, Apollo and Dionysus strive for victory. Apollo makes the boundary lines that are civilization, but that lead to convention, constraint, oppression. Dionysus is energy unbound, mad, callous, destructive, wasteful. Apollo is law, history, tradition, the dignity and safety of custom and form, 
Dionysus is the new, exhilarating but rude, sweeping all the way to begin again. Apollo is a tyrant, Dionysus a vandal. The Apollonian is aristocratic, monarchist, and reactionary. Volatile, mobile Dionysus is hoi polloi, the many. He is rabble and rubble, both democratic mob rule and the slurry of uncountable objects rumbling through nature. Apollo freezes, Dionysus dissolves. Apollo says stop, Dionysus says move. Apollo binds together and battens down against the storm of nature. Paglia associates Apollo with masculinity and Dionysus with femininity. Man is Apollo, culture, reason, whilst woman is Dionysus, nature and emotion. This idea will be dismissed by most as a relic of patriarchy, but I am not so sure. The female body and its procreative functions place women closer to nature. For nine months, she is consumed by the processes surrounding the reproduction of the species, often at a great cost to her personal health, strength, and general stability. Her vitamin and mineral resources are channeled into nourishing the fetus, depleting her own strength and energies. At the end of this nine-month struggle, women give birth to a child. This process is painful and often dangerous. These physiological facts led the feminist philosopher Simone de Beauvoir to argue that the female is more enslaved to the species than the male. Her animality is more manifest. She points out that many major areas and processes of the woman's body serve no apparent function for the health and stability of the individual woman. Instead, the woman's body serves the species. This is why Paglia says, The female body is a Chthonian machine, indifferent to the spirit who inhabits it. Organically, it has one mission, pregnancy, which we may spend a lifetime staving off. Nature cares only for species, never individuals. The humiliating dimensions of this biologic fact are more directly experienced by women, who probably have a greater realism and wisdom than men because of it. For a fetus is a benign tumor, a vampire who steals in order to live. The so-called miracle of birth is nature getting her own way. The male's role in procreation is, by contrast, minor. He contributes nine minutes rather than nine months. Many anthropologists believe that early man did not even understand the role he played in pregnancy. For example, in his book, The Family Among Australian Aborigines, the anthropologist Bronislaw Malinowski observes, The natives one and all in these tribes believe that the child is the direct result of the entrance into the mother of an ancestral spirit individual. They have no idea of procreation as being directly associated with sexual intercourse, and firmly believe that children can be born without this taking place. There are, for example, in the Oronta country, certain stones which are supposed to be charged with spirit children, who can, by magic, be made to enter the bodies of women, or will do so on their own accord. Similar ideas about procreation appear in many different primitive cultures. Indeed, Malinowski goes on to say, Primitive mankind was certainly wholly ignorant of the process of procreation. In other words, primitive man believed that women were in magical communion with nature. To quote Paglia, Woman's fertility, following its own laws, inspired awe and fear. This awe and fear placed women at the center of early religion. Women possessed natural creative powers that men did not. To quote Paglia's mentor, Harold Bloom, Woman is born of woman, but man is born of woman and never recovers from that fact. In other words, he resents the natural creative powers that women have. Because he lacks these powers, he has to assert creativity externally through the medium of technology. He gives birth to tools instead of children. Through these tools, he begins to assert himself over women and nature. He creates culture. As culture advances, both nature and women recede in importance. In short, Paglia's book, Sexual Personae, reaffirms stereotypes about gender. To quote the cancelled preface to Sexual Personae, 
despite my deviant and rebellious beginnings, I have been led by my studies to reaffirm the most archaic myths about male and female. The most archaic myths about male and female can be stated as follows. Female is nature, male is culture. According to Puglia, we reject these archaic myths at our peril. Indeed, Puglia believes that the breakdown of gender norms leads to societal collapse. She discussed this idea at the Battle of Ideas Festival in the United Kingdom. Now, I began my, all my studies, my, my book Sexual Personae began as a dissertation at Yale uh, Graduate School on androgyny. I've always been fascinated, attracted you know, to the subject of androgyny, uh, and, and that's what Sexual Personae is. I explored it in history. But the, the more I explored it, I realized that, um, that historically, this, uh, this, uh, the movement toward androgyny occurs in late phases of culture, okay, as a, as a civilization is starting to uh, unravel, okay, and that, that you can find it again and again and again through history in the in, in the in the Greek art, okay, you can you can see it happening. All of a sudden, okay, there's a, there's a kind of, uh, you know, the the, the sculptures of of, um, of handsome nude young men athletes that used to be very robust, okay, in the archaic period suddenly begin to seem like wet noodles, okay, uh, toward the end, okay, and that, uh, and that, and that the people who, who, who live in such periods, a late phase of culture, whether it's, it's the Hellenistic era, whether it's the Roman Empire, whether it's, it's uh, the Mauve decade of Oscar Wilde in the 1890s, whether it's Weimar Germany, people who live in such times, okay, feel that um, they're very sophisticated, they're very cosmopolitan, okay, and homosexuality, heterosexuality, so what, anything goes, and so on, All right, and so, and but, but we, from the perspective of, of historical distance, okay, you can see that it's a culture that no longer believes in itself, okay, and then, and, and then what, you, what you invariably get are, are, you know, are, are, are people who are convinced of the power of heroic masculinity, okay, on the edges, whether they're the Vandals and the Huns, okay, or whether, or whether they're the barbarians of ISIS, okay, you see them, you know, starting to mass on the outsides of the culture, and that's what we have right now, that there is a tremendous uh, and, and, and rather terrifying disconnect between the infatuation with the transgender movement in, in, in our own culture and what's going on out there.